Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the second installment of the new Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Just to kick off the um, second in the series, John and Kelly will discuss the series, uh, discuss today Data Lake versus Data Warehouse. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. Also joining us is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of the First San Francisco Partners. Having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management, Kelly has played important roles to many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise, recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions. She founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. How Hello. Is How is everybody today out there listening? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are. Hello there, Kelly. Hello. Hello. So let's, uh, we shall get started. I shall move on. First of all, the, um, the topics for today. We are going to talk about some definitional things. We have a wide variety of people listening to these um, uh, um, webinars and some very experienced people out there listening uh, for, you know, little gems and insights, which we hope to provide. But there's also some people that are still uh, grappling around some basic fundamental issues. So um, uh, we will start today with some uh, definition and differences and some conceptual things, getting into some optimization and how to deal with those various weaknesses and strengths. And take a look at some examples because that always helps tell uh, the story. Um, and uh, then end up with some findings and uh, some takeaways, and maybe you might hear something you uh, weren't expecting to hear that. Then again, maybe you are going to expect to hear, but we'll find out, and we'll, as always, we will leave some time for some questions, uh, and then we'll try to answer as many as we can. If we can't answer them, please keep submitting them. We do get around to answering those questions uh, at some point after uh, the event. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll just keep going here. We're going to start by asking all of you a question. Um, and it's a poll. And uh, Shannon, the poll is uh, available to the folks, I believe. And we're ready to go on that. Um, so, uh, and if not, just pop in and say no. Uh, other than that, away we go here with the poll. First question, what type of data repository does your organization currently have and actively use? And the key there is actively using, because almost everybody or a lot of people could have some, you know, something that they built a while ago and nobody uses it. So, you know, it's got to be using it. If you haven't, if you're not using it, just say neither, all right? Uh, is Lake a warehouse or both or neither? Second question, if your organization has repository, you're going to do something to it, like enhance it or which improve it, streamline, put some investment in it uh, in the coming year. And, you know, yes, no, and we don't know, which is perfectly acceptable uh, um, uh, to this. Um, um, so anyway, uh, Shannon is... Uh, um, um, we have the first question open, which just which just closed. Uh, we, I sorry, I set it up as one question at a time. So let me push out oh, okay. the poll results. There, can you see? Oh, okay. Well, we'll just do this. We'll just, uh, this. We're pushing this out as we speak. There it is. I see. I see. I see. All right. Um, There's question one. Okay. Let's push that now. Now everyone can answer it, right? Um, no, everyone's answered so we, it. So. 
Question one, it looks like uh, uh, the vast majority are um, using data warehouses or um, are using data warehouses. Uh, one, only one person is using a data lake and 20, 102 are using data warehouses and uh, only 28 are using uh, both and 22 mm -hmm. are neither. And the other 200 people are just hanging out. That's what I see. They are. Okay. All right. That's decided. Okay. <laughs> Wait until after the webinar, and then they're going to answer the question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Are we ready to push out number two then? Absolutely. Here we go. Here it goes. Poll is All right. open. All right. If you have one of these things, are there plans to do something with it, like enhance it? Uh, you know, if you have a warehouse and you're thinking lakeish, you know, are you going to spend some money this year, next this year, or no, or you know, going to hold pat? Um, or you don't know, and that would be uh, another good question here. Um, and it, this is helping us to uh, find our audience. We have a lot of people listening to these, which is wonderful, but we also know that that means a very, very diverse uh, level of experience um, and uh, um, skill and architectures and such. So uh, we do appreciate you giving us a little bit of insight here. We'll probably ask a few more polls as in a few more webinars here as the year uh, goes on. Um, and um, the time limit is 30 seconds on these, and that's why I'm just talking here, because I think <laughs> we're almost up to it right now, if my we are, the, in, are out. Are correct. There we go. And there we go. Um, uh, we have a lot of people not really, uh, most people are going to do something this year, and then everyone else is just not, not, not. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty good. Though. So the majority of folks are just going are going to do something. So I think we're going to get some insight out of this. And at this point, we'll just uh, move on to. Um, I think we can move on here. Do I have control back? Yes, I do. I'll move on. And uh, Kelly, take it away. Hello, Kelly. Hello, world. There's my mute button. So uh, really interesting results. Thank you guys for participating. And, and one of the things when we were thinking about this poll, we thought about, uh, I guess, Shannon, was it a year ago that we did our survey around, it was more data science versus, uh, you know, business intelligence and that sort of thing. But I think it was a similar sort of outcome where there is still quite a bit of investment happening in data warehouses, even though the talk is all about data lakes. Anyway, that's very interesting comparative uh, poll. But so just pulling from, you know, the uh, industry analyst, Gartner, how do we define a data warehouse versus a data lake? So data warehouses are generally constructed to solve predefined questions or to aggregate data for a known set of analysis and reporting needs. And as a result, they have clearly defined user communities. Many times data marts are built on top of data warehouses to then provide an even more specific user community, a subset of that aggregated data that is structured in a way that makes the most sense to that community, like a finance data mart or a sales data mart or what have you. So it's a storage architecture. Now a data lake is also a type of a storage architecture but it tends to be more broad, more distributed. And data lakes are designed for more fluid environments, no pun intended, in which some of the questions are known, but many of the questions are not known. And as a result, the potential users of that data in the lake are also highly fluid. Um, data can be uh, presented in a variety of different ways, and so it does need to consider the fact that it isn't a predefined community that's asking a relatively predefined set of questions, which means you don't know what information they're looking for and what uh, attributes of the data they will be looking for. So it's, it's kind of trying to fill this unknown uh, dark abyss that's in the bottom of the ocean here, represented by uh, the iceberg, which is one of my favorite graphics. So just for some very simple level setting, and we thought it would also be good to quote James Dixon, who is uh, thought to be the creator of the term data lake. So someone could uh, 
correct me, but that's the, the as far as our research shows, all, all um, arrows point to him. And so I know that he talks about data marts here, but you can consider this description that he's providing as uh, also describing a data warehouse. So in the past, the standard way to handle reporting and analysis was to identify the data, identify the most interesting attributes, aggregate these into a data mart, and provide that data in, as he says, a cleansed, packaged, and structured way for easy consumption by those known communities of users. So um, the challenge with that, of course, and, and this is pulled from the same blog post in which he quotes this uh, distinction between a data mark and a data lake, the challenge is that only a subset of those attributes are examined. So the assumption is, is that you know everything that you need to know when you set up that data mart or the data warehouse, if you will. Um, and the, the data is aggregated. So there's a um, level of visibility that is lost because the fact that the data is aggregated versus the data lake was created kind of to address those challenges and requirements uh, in order to provide a more optimal solution that provides the data in that kind of raw, natural state, and that's why it's called the data lake. So just a little bit of background. So some of the key differences, as you've probably heard as I was kind of talking through this anyway, um, the data warehouse, uh, in the data warehouse, the data itself is structured. So it's alphanumeric characters that are uh, in a row and column structure traditionally held in some sort of relational database management system versus a data lake can take that structured data, but it can also take things like images, videos, or any other sort of data that doesn't conform to a certain model. So it could be the very raw data. It could be um, lots of different data types at the same time. Um, the way that the data is processed through a data warehouse versus a data lake is actually one of the biggest differences between the two and is uh, an interesting way to consider uh, when to use one versus when to use the other. So um, schema on right basically just means that structure is applied to the data as it is loaded into the data warehouse. Therefore, schema on read means that the structure is applied as the data is pulled out of the data lake. So fancy terms, but the implication is, is that if you're providing that structure as the data is pulled out of the data lake, then you have the opportunity to apply multiple structures or lens depending upon the purpose that the data is being used for. So this concept of structure versus unstructure um, also comes up. Uh, there is a big cost difference in terms of volume. Um, originally, Hadoop was uh, used most commonly for just cheap, high volume storage. And so as the usage became a lot more sophisticated, people were using it more for analysis and that sort of thing. And I know a lot of people are still using it just for low cost storage, which is, you know, great. Um, because a data warehouse has this requirement of structured data, schema on right, et cetera, uh, this requirement for structure makes it more fixed, less agile, obviously. But what that means is it can be incredibly time consuming to change those structures to add new elements, new data types, new data sources, et cetera. Um, in fact, when, when we were prepping for this, I remembered a client, uh, it was about three years ago now, but when we first started working with them, uh, one of their issues was the performance of the data warehouse. And we asked them, well, how long does it take if you want to add a new source to the data warehouse? And their answer was nine months. <laughs> or a little gobsmacked at that answer. And I know that there's a lot of different reasons for why the time frame could be long like that. But part of it is because of the requirement for so much structure. If the structure fits the requirement when it's built, imagine if that requirement changes and you need to refine that structure. It's kind of like uh, building a house from the ground up the first time is a lot easier of a task than doing a remodel. So I don't know if either if anybody in the audience has done one or the other. Uh, my brother's a builder and he prefers ground up versus remodel any day of the week. <laughs> 
Um, obviously, there's a maturity difference. And then there's, like we said, a consumer difference. Data warehouses and data marts are generally consumed by specific lines of business that are looking to do things like operational reporting. Um, versus the data lake, we've coined this new term, data scientists. And it's a special, fancy, and, of course, more highly paid <laughs> sort of analytical user that has experience with different uh, tools and different capabilities to take advantage of the volumes uh, within the data lake. So these are some key differences that will start to play into our conversation around um, appropriate use and uh, uh, best use of one versus the other or together, as we will discuss as the um, webinar goes on. Back to you, John. Thanks, uh, Kelly. And I'm watching, uh, just a quick review here, we're watching the um, uh, um, questions coming in and uh, that we're already getting um, something I was anticipating, which is a flurry of questions about, uh, and that the root of all of them is meaning um, and some of the definitions we've used uh, already. Um, and this is a kind of uh, a theme here, and you're going to uh, see some more of this as we go through. There are um, there are no pigeons, okay? We, we, a lot of the questions are, well, you said the data warehouse is this. Well, it also is that. And yes, there are shades of gray around everything here. So um, we will we will be addressing that actually here in a little while. Let's talk about the challenges of the data lake. Um, because they are a very popular type construct and a lot of organizations are building them. And what we're seeing out there in our practice is, is uh, um, uh, they're, they're usually a rough start. Um, um, a few, a few uh, nuggets uh, come out and then the sustainability is, is questionable. Uh, some classic reasons around that um, are the resource intensiveness of, of early instantiations of this. You've got to get some really smart people that uh, know about this stuff, and they're probably not around. Um, uh, believe it or not, they can be inflexible too, um, uh, in a different way, just because of the uh, volumes involved. Um, they start out very sandbox-like, but they're not necessarily meant to be sandbox-like. Um, security, privacy, and governance, going to kind of put all those three together. Uh, um, these are structures that, that aren't intended to be Wild West and freeform. Um, they do have to have some discipline to them, but we see a lack of that. That also is, re is uh, uh, evidence in the clutter of several speakers uh, in this area use the, the family junk drawer analogy, and uh, anyone that has that, that drawer in their kitchen, you know, next to the refrigerator or wherever that uh, everything goes in. Um, I know when I was a kid, I used to just enjoy dumping it out and exploring what had found its way in there. But um, uh, we do get into this cluttered and you can't find uh, things. Um, the the overconfidence is kind of uh, uh, something that comes back and gets folks because a lot of money gets spent. Uh, some really smart people do some really cool things with it and come up with a result, and that result doesn't work the magic that uh, they heard. Uh, these are not unlike some of the uh, um, early drawbacks of the early data warehouse technology either. Um, and these are all kind of growing pains, but these are all legitimate challenges that are there um, at, at, at this point in time. Um, the warehouse itself, the, I mean, it still has its challenges there. Um, uh, of talking about that, um, the enterprise model where, where uh, you know, in order to find things and load things, whether it's a star schema or a snowflake or normalized or denormalized or whatever, flavor of that you, 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 you want or think it is or think it should be, um, there's modeling involved. And a lot of times, as most of us out there in practitioner land knows, the, the data modeling and instantiating a model and getting it approved can be a difficult thing. Adding new data and subjects can take a long time. We did have a question where someone said it takes us a, a very short amount of time. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, that is that is the exception. Uh, that is not the rule. It's typically six to nine months for most shops to add a new subject area uh, or make a major change to a subject area. Um, <clears throat> kind of ties that back to that model thing and thing. Um, 
Uh, when you really hit the number of folks you want to use it, um, they tend to get a bit uh, doggy. Um, and of course, governance has to be there because if you don't know what it means and can't find it, it's difficult to get the benefits out of it. Um, some of these problems result in the expansion of the shadow IT or the departmental BI. People get tired of waiting, uh, and because of that, uh, they do it themselves. Um, Hadoop is out there as an option for the enterprise data warehouse, absolutely. And, uh, but what we're seeing is they tend to be siloed right now um, and not even part of a central uh, approved enterprise architecture. Um, and lastly, uh, we've, you know, there have been always big scalable solutions for data warehouses. All you have are appliances. There are vendors who have specialized over the years in very large data warehouses. None of them are, are inexpensive. Um, and so uh, there are a set of challenges there. So why are we talking about all this depressing stuff here? Well, we're going to kind of get into some good news, and then we're going to talk about how this all works out. I'll turn this back over here to Kelly to talk about some data lake good stuff that we've seen. Absolutely. So wanted to just, uh, in this slide and then the next slide, we'll talk about some use cases. Uh, so these are three use cases um, for the data lake brought to us by um, a partner organization that we work with quite closely. And there are three great examples of a different purpose for a data lake. So on the left-hand side, uh, this is a large medical device manufacturer, and they implemented a data lake kind of for a similar sort of internal analytical function that potentially could also have been done via a data warehouse, but based on some of the requirements that they had, they decided to use a data lake structure. It is a pure cost center, and it's used to support data scientists and analysts to see if they can develop analytics and models that assist in improving the operational efficiency of the organization. So they, can they find trending uh, around internal processes that will enable them to make recommendations to increase productivity, increase efficiency, and therefore over time reduce cost. Thereby they could uh, uh, justify it being a cost center because the goal is that they are going to be driving best practices and driving improvements uh, across the rest of the organization as a result. Uh, in this instance, it's entirely internal. There is no connection to the outside world, and so it can be uh, built entirely uh, on site in a building that you can lock it down through, uh, you know, physical lock, security badges, et cetera. In this instance, it would be architected so that you've got a traditional landing zone, a transformation zone where standardization uh, occurs, and then, of course, the discovery zone where you put the analytics on top in order to consume the data. So that that business purpose was determined when they created the data lake. Now, if we think about the second example, this is in which a data lake is used to create a differentiator for the company. So think about this as your uh, concept of recommendations. And the data lake, in fact, helps to drive additional services and additional product that can be provided to the client. So through the concept of recommendations, additional products can be uh, presented for consumption and purchase and things like that. This is uh, so that the user could consume more features. They can consume more, um, uh, you know, of the Netflix content, whether it is, you know, the traditional DVDs or whether it is the streaming content, et cetera. Um, and it helps in the user experience and the buying process. So in this case, they use products like Splunk to help manage the clickstream data. So it's a very different environment because it's real time versus the uh, medical device manufacturer, uh, the requirement for real time was less of a priority versus uh, for the operational differentiator, real time is absolutely a product, um, a different, sorry, real time was a requirement which would drive uh, the tools and the, and the solutions that they would implement as a result. Um, and in this real-time environment, they would not have the ability to go through the landing zone, transformation zone, you know, et cetera, like the medical device manufacturer. Again, 
different use case, different architecture, different tools. Now the last one, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, is one in which they were truly monetizing the data and access to the data lake is actually sold to companies where they can access the data themselves and run their own analysis. For example, does the Dow Jones Index always go up in the time period between 3.30 and 4 p.m. when the market closes? Or does it only happen on certain days of the week? Or does it only happen when options expirations occur? So the idea is that people can pay to access all of the data that the NYSE has and uh, be able to take advantage of the lake directly. Implications here are that it has to have a very scalable multi-tenant architecture. It has to have extraordinarily high security, increased firewall protection, and of course, uh, the secure user login identity management, et cetera. So the point here is that these are all uses of the data lake. They're all very different architectural approaches and it has different implications for when you're building the lake. So uh, to consider what is your business strategy for the lake as you start to construct it, uh, because there are different requirements based on the way that you're planning on uh, using the data, whether it's internally, externally, real-time batch, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good questions coming in here. Uh, one I want to make sure that uh, one that just recently came in we really got to hit that one in fact i'm just going to hit it now if i uh, would uh, if you don't mind um data lakes seem to be the result of poor data modeling descriptive versus semantic um the thing with the data lake is it's, it's raw um there is no data modeling uh, a priori before it goes in that is a significant almost a cultural difference to those of us that have been perhaps doing the rows and columns stuff for 20 or 30 or uh, 35 years or so. Um, there, there is no, uh, as when Kelly went over the difference thing, when you talk about data modeling, that implies a schema ahead of time. There is no schema ahead of time on many, many of the data lake approaches. It, the schema is derived once someone figures out what they're looking at. Really, really different than what we're used to, right? Um, most of the folks on the poll, one of the reasons we took it was to, you know, have done data warehouse. So here's our use case for data warehouse. So this is a recent data warehouse. This is not something that was like, oh, wow, you know, they just didn't understand what big data or Hadoop was or whatever. But this is an organization that, through some analysis, determined it not quite ready uh, for that type of, 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 of thing. And uh, they had some, uh, uh, an insurance company with some market-driven issues where, uh, it's uh, independent agents puts a lot of stress on uh, insurance companies now, as well as the those of us that watch television for more than 30 minutes a day will see at least two or three commercials for uh, car insurance, for example. And it's a tough, tough market. Um, uh, and 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 this was an evolving environment. Notice we have two operational data stores here because they were there were two. Um, there were lots of the data marts. And, and, and we just kind of labeled the whole thing data warehouse. And, and, and out there with some extra data movement, we created this analytical data that they could actually tackle this problem of agent and policyholder our retention. It was driven on an appliance and it lived merrily with all the other stuff moving around what we call data wrangling. Um, now, is this what you would draw ideally as, a, as an Inman-esque or a Kimball-esque architecture no but you know it fit and it and it did it and the users were in them in the areas that were most uh, uh could most help address the business problem um, sales marketing uh, underwriting to make sure that the, that they weren't losing their shirt on products and then uh, the claims to make sure that service was adequate for uh, the customers so um uh, uh more traditional sort of but a little untraditional, but again, this is primarily what we would call the data warehouse type architecture for for that this particular use case. In both cases, though, driving business driving business benefit. Um, now we've talked about data warehouse. We have talked about data lake. There are some differences. Some of our questions are reflecting that that this is you know that these are differences. Um, um, so, um, and there's some, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some of the old uh, Kimball versus Inman type things then. Um, uh, but we want to make a point here that this isn't about choosing going forward. 
this is really about what fits your maturity, uh, what fits what you're doing with uh, uh, the data. Um, the, uh, um, you can look at this many, many ways. You can look at uh, how you use the data. You can look at uh, some, some, you know, how you perceive what maturity looks like. You can use how the business or the organization is, 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 is uh, responding to its environment. Uh, you can even assign some technical characteristics to that. Uh, in, you know, many, many years ago when we did reporting and stuff, you know, what happened yesterday, then we want to know what happens. And predictive analytics is what will happen. But we're moving very rapidly even beyond that to make things happen by themselves, um, being more adaptive through machine learning, things like that. And, you know, what should we do next? Actually making recommendations based on, uh, um, uh, on data. Um, and, and, you know, you can label all this a bunch of uh, by ways, and, and it would be it's a great uh, discussion to talk about uh, all of these things. But the key is that it's not really about choosing. On, on one, one side of this, you could say that it's data warehouse ish type stuff as we're used to them historically being used. On the other hand, you can say it's data lake type stuff. Um, uh, but um, that's not necessarily true because we can get benefits uh, out, of, out of both uh, of, of those. So if, you know, the thing to bear in mind as we're moving forward here is understand kind of what you want to do with with all of 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 this of this information and it's what does your business need from all of that information now we're going to talk about how to deal with some of the challenges we've talked about and 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 address those but as we go through those we're still not we're what we're saying here is don't be uh, John and Kelly said we should have a data warehouse John and Kelly said we should have a day late we're not saying that what we're saying is if you're going to have something that's data warehouse-ish or data lake-ish, you're going to have to deal with some challenges and, 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 and head some problems off at the past that are already popping up on the newer things and things we've known about for years on the quote-unquote older type things. Okay. But the fact is that you're, you're not going to fit, not anybody fits into one particular thing into the one uh, or the other. I, I, um, anything to add to this one, Kelly, before we move on? This is this is kind of a big one here. Yeah, no, I think that this is this is probably the the meat of this presentation, and and we'll talk and provide some additional examples going forward. Is that technology is always evolving, and you know data warehouses evolve for a reason, data lakes evolve for a reason, and there's going to be another technology that evolves for another reason, right? And the idea is that each organization is within a different uh, level of maturity with different business requirements. And the idea is to think about what are those business requirements first and how do you then architect an approach that establish, that meets those business requirements, understanding your existing architecture, the existing tools available to you, your organizational cap capabilities, the amount of money you want to spend, et cetera, et cetera. And every organization is going to be in a different level uh, and we'll give some further examples of how organizations have been able to leapfrog some capabilities. Other organizations are still dealing in some significant legacy environments where they need to move a bit more like a battleship and that's just reality but that's the way that they can make progress. And, and before we move on to uh, the next one here, um, mm -hmm. one thing I'm noticing in some of the questions coming by is we are having a, and it's an interesting discussion, and it is maybe worth having in an additional in the future here, um, the perception that a data warehouse is a certain thing or a data lake is a certain thing. Um, and again, just to remind some folks, we showed some, some common definitions. But there's going to be academic differences between what we've shown you and and uh, what some other people might say. Um, but you know, for the sake of our discussion here, uh, we've gone and and picked the contemporary things. If you have a 
Um, a good example would be if you have a data warehouse that is a, you know, the classical monolithic historical time variant structure and you're using it, and that's wonderful, that's fine, that's awesome. But that definition has morphed over the years. And, and it might not, you know, if uh, Gartner is a good source of some new thinking about really what a data warehouse represents, um, if you're a Gartner client or have access to that type of stuff, that might be something for some of you asking some of these questions. So um, I wanted to throw that in there before we move on to some of the specific optimization things. Um, ready to go? I think, uh, Kelly, it's your turn here. Sure. And uh, again, just to reiterate what we learned from those data lake use cases, that it is important to start with some sort of purpose versus a build it and they will come approach. And then once that's done, the approach for optimizing the data lake ensures that you maintain the vision for which you started in the first place so that it doesn't be, become a swamp. And recognizing that there are very uh, specific things that you need to do to maintain the rapid and scalable ingestion process. So although the tools are different, the same priorities apply in the sense of performance, data protection and understanding, and an integrated approach to the rest of your environment. Now, it's also critically important to consider the capability of your users and address any skill gaps that might occur. So I've heard that there are 40 job openings for every data scientist on the market. So you may disagree with that number. So whether that number is correct or whether the correct number is 20, that's still a big gap. And so the reality is, is if you think that you will be able to hire all new people, not just to build, but also to use the data lake, then your cost uh, ratio just skyrocketed because the competition out there is going to be fierce for the one in 20 slots. So it's a good idea to plan on upskilling some of your existing superstars, helping them through the transition from some of the older technologies to some of the more innovative technologies. And then, of course, putting some golden handcuffs on them so they don't leave to take advantage of the disequilibrium in the market. But I think the reality is, is that that uh, skill um, and the uh, ability to manage it yourself versus hiring uh, external parties to do that for you is very important. Now, in some instances, you may need to provide something like a warehouse-esque environment as part of the data lake to accommodate those users who are more comfortable with a structured format. And I saw a question come in about, is anybody using Hive to do that? And absolutely. In fact, we've got one client who is using Hive to have a, you know, I'm using air quotes right now, a warehouse uh, within their data lake. And this is a way that they are maintaining a unified architecture and a unified plan while accommodating these multiple user types. And so, you know, it is, as John said, it's not only, you know, it's not this or that, but how do you accommodate the different um, requirements of your user communities? And what I think is uh, compelling about this client is that they are, they have a wonderful opportunity because they don't have a legacy infrastructure. They're a spinoff um, from an organization and they have um, both the opportunity to uh, create a new infrastructure based on their current uh, business requirements and they're lucky enough to have the funding to do that. So they are leveraging Data Lake first and then looking at warehouse you know, again, with the air quotes, warehouse second to accommodate people that need a more sort of structured data approach. And absolutely, uh, Hive's a great way to do that. Back to you, John. Okie doke. Um, so on a data warehouse, if you're going to be using the data warehouse-ish things, there's some lessons we've learned a long time and uh, they're worth reinforcing. Um, uh, here with a, a lot of you because I, you know, I, I love these questions coming in are great because it's showing such a tremendous range of people applying technology and, you know, literally in the questions from seeing two or three generations of technology uh, in the questions, which is uh, uh, amazing. And it, it, it just shows why this is such an important series 
uh, for us to keep to, to keep uh, hammering away here. Um, you know, we're talking about metadata because uh, uh, the data warehouse type things is its schema going on in. So your metadata has got to be good. It's got to be easy to find things. Um, uh, a lot of data warehouses have, have languished because even with all of the upfront work, you still can't find it. Same thing with, 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 with structure. There has to be enough consistency that you can navigate through the thing, find. Um, there has to be trust through data quality. Um, uh, um, um, the, 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 this is a timeless discussion on data warehouse. Um, I, I, there's a part of me that, and this is kind of tongue in cheek, but if, if, if shops with good data warehouse, some smart people and some, some good enterprise architecture would just stop messing around with cleaning stuff up and fix data quality, put a little bit of oversight on structure, um, I'd have to, part of my job would be different on a weekly basis. I might even have to find some other type of work or, you know, do a lot more MDM and a lot more data governance type work because that would solve so many problems that, that create departmental uh, BI. We've, we have had clients that when we have assessed their cost of using data to do things, that only 10% of their total investment uh, is their data warehouse department or their uh, um, their uh, information center of excellence or whatever you want to call that, the ICE, the BIC, the ACE, or the, we've seen lots of different acronyms for those areas. But we're talking only one ten. We're talking an order of magnitude more spending outside of the official architecture. And that's a lot of money, even though it is getting people the data they need to do their job. It's a lot of money. And we could really, really manage that better. And of course, governance uh, is there too. Um, and this, this slide's kind of a recap or reinforcement that if you're going to be data warehouse-ish with some of your things, you really still need to uh, consider um, these basic fundamental lessons learned over, over the years. Now, now let's, you know, let's kind of move this together. Uh, Kelly brought up a really cool example that, that we have, um, and we've seen several of this, where um, <clears throat> for those of you that have been doing data warehouse a while, I will use this kind of uh, um, uh, analogy. Uh, you probably have a staging area or something prior to a, an operational data store or maybe even a staging area before it goes into the, the, the uh, classical monolithic data warehouse. So imagine that, st that staging area has to be where stuff goes and, and it, 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 in a relatively unfiltered format or slightly filtered uh, format. Well. Replace that with uh, a lake. Replace that with a Hadoop-based structure. You're, it's kind of the same thing. You're putting a lot of stuff in there without a whole lot of concern about what it is, but we're going to square it away and figure it out and, and clean it up. So that way, with this lack of agility and the performance issues, you start to address those. You start to bridge over to the, to the easier to put stuff in and get stuff out and let you experiment with that. Um, um, but it hasn't gone into the data warehouse yet where, where um, uh, once it's in there, it's got to be structured, it's got to be easy to find, and it's got to fit into this, you know, relational uh, protocol. Um, you also, also, we can have, of course, the unstructured data with the, um, with, with, uh, uh, the Hadoop type structure or in, or in uh, the, the data lake. Uh, the second or the leapfrog uh, uh, analogy that, that Kelly mentioned earlier is is just um, uh, if it's that remodeling thing. If you if you start to look at what's it going to take to bring our second uh, generation warehouse up to a fourth generation type structure, um, you know there there is a strong case to be made to just turn the whole thing into a lake. Just and then take the lake and uh, in Bill Inman's book, Data Lake Architecture, he talks about data ponds. Um, you can go build ponds, you can build sandboxes, you can build a warehouse, um, and you can go on that. So you could evolve from the warehouse to the lake if, again, you address some of those issues we talked about earlier. You still need to know what things mean. Schema on read is cool for a data scientist. It's not cool for anyone else. If you want a sustainable product, 
that people were going to dip into and create a pond or create a mart or, or whatever, there still has to be some reasonable sense to that and some governance uh, and, 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 and some oversight around those, um, uh, uh, the, the, those types of, of structures. Um, and, uh, I think I, I think I got that one nailed down. <laughs> Kelly, is there anything else you want to add to that one? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting really passionate about this. For those of you that don't <laughs> know, uh, my background, I started in warehouse in 88. And that was before, and then some guy tackled me literally in a hallway in 1990, and his name was Bill Inman, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know, we're just doing something for the client. He says, well, I invented the data warehouse, you're doing a data warehouse. And we're like, wow, that's really cool. We have, he's been a, a buddy of mine ever since. But um, I've been in this a long, long time and have seen every shape and size and application of this type of stuff. And the one thing before I leave this slide, because Kelly knows me well enough, I'm on the soapbox now. I'll do 10 more seconds here. <laughs> is you have to have an open mind. You have to be very flexible with this stuff, especially going forward because the demands, like those use cases she showed us, are incredible and they are generating gobs of money for these organizations and you can do it for yours but you're going to have to really have an open mind and be be flexible on some of this stuff okay i'm sorry here we go next slide there <laughs> actually we go. not next slide yet so not one next of the slide. Things, oh yeah let's go back okay sure yeah so one of the things that that is uh interesting is that just because you try and leapfrog and go directly to the data lake doesn't mean that the that the challenges go away, right? In the sense that, so the same client who was able to uh, create their infrastructure brand new um, are using their data lake as their uh, primary data repository within their organization from which to do analytics and that sort of thing, uh, realize that they have naming convention problems and that the customer names are not standardized and end up with a big mess that makes it very hard to accurately analyze that data. And so, you know, they have a master data issue, right? Well, they don't want to go out and invest millions of dollars and implement a master data management solution, and so they created a name canonicalization model that they're going to use to help standardize and aggregate names. And so that essentially they're, they've custom built a mastering process within the lake. So, you know, regardless of your opinion on that, I think it's highly creative. I think it solves the business process. And in, and in their viewpoint, it's a much more economical way than taking the traditional master data management approach. And I do think that that sort of creativity is going to continue to occur. And then ultimately, there might be uh, a more economical way to, you know, quote unquote, master the data in the lake rather than doing uh, custom um, custom builds and things like that. So anyway, I think it's just it's very interesting, and and it just shows the multiple ways that you can creatively use the concept of the lake as a as a um, data repository, uh, and at the same time, realize that some of the old challenges don't just go away. Yeah, and it can, it's a perfect segue to, um, and then you've heard this already, I'm not going to, we're not going to spend but 30 seconds on this uh, part of the story here. Blend, be creative. Uh, it's not an either or debate. Um, there are some real powerful advantages to either structure. The data warehouse is not dead, some people are saying. The lake is going to kill the warehouse. I don't believe that for a minute, but but uh, um, I think we have another tool in the toolbox. Um, so we have some time for questions. I want to just talk about the process to get there. Um, and Kelly and I are going to kind of, we'll just walk through this uh, together here. Uh, so when in doubt, all right, take a look at all of your business requirements. Upper left-hand corner of this panel here is a uh, deliberately fuzzy representation of a lot of requirements. Um, and then some type of analysis to that. And I mean real engineering kind of analysis to that. Just don't say, well, um, uh, and I, I, I see this a lot. Uh, uh, um, Kelly can uh, back me up on this one. We'll see some people saying, well, you know, that really is something that a data warehouse should do. Boom, boom, we do the data warehouse. Or, you know, that's, that's, uh, um, that's analytical. It's got to be in the data lake. 
and bang, it goes there. Well, actually, no. Um, there are ways, we don't have time today to do it, but there are techniques and, and, and uh, quantitative techniques, qualitative techniques, algorithms, all kinds of stuff to figure out what you need. What you find out is the lower right-hand corner. The lower right-hand corner, what you find is a bunch of requirements are gonna bump into a predictive bucket or models or plain old BI or maybe operational alerts or some trending reporting ad hoc reporting or just plain old row and column, hey, what happened yesterday type stuff. And you're going to find that there's this whole spectrum in your organization and there is not going to be one necessary answer. And your result becomes engineered. And what we have here is kind of a hybrid architecture on, on the left here. It's overly simple. I know some of you are going to send a note now and say, well, that's not really, no, this is, this is simple, all right, okay. Um, you know, the data's got to land somewhere. None of us have a clear picture of our data landscape. Hardly any of us do. And most of us have more sources than we really want to have data sources, right? So it has to land somewhere. Then it has to get ingested because ingestion is a formal process for a lake or a Hadoop type uh, in environment. Um, and we can put it in the lake. And here it sits, kind of that quasi staging area we talked about. We can spin off a sandbox really easy from that. We can even do analytics directly against the raw data if we want because it's schema on read, so that's okay. But we could also take that and create a data warehouse and fulfill and supply our BI needs as well. So this hybrid architecture is very, very possible. So just to review this, document your business needs. Yes, you get your metadata, the stuff you want the business to do, the stuff you want to measure, good old-fashioned data strategy, data architecture stuff. Get those patterns. There's patterns that will tell you warehouse-ish or lake-ish or in-between-ish. Those patterns will make groupings. Now you know who your audiences are. And do your best fit. And this is kind of a, uh, Gartner uses the term of a logical data warehouse and it is kind of a good way to look at things now. It's not just a monolithic one database anymore. It's, it's you have to come up with a bunch of places that people can navigate to do the job that needs to be done by your organization. Um, and so now we will move into the Q&A session. Uh, we want to, let's see here, um, uh, um, uh, 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 I guess we should just wind down through these. Uh, let me just go back here a little bit. Um, uh, boy, there's a lot of them. Where can we start here? Let's see. These are all time stamped. Good heavens. This is a big one. Thank you for all these people for hanging in here. Um, uh, um, well, let's just start uh, to uh, about 40 minutes ago. Do you see companies using Lake to do traditional warehouse? Like uh, type two slowly changing dimensions. Now, for one thing, I could tell you that there's people that will argue that saying type two slowly changing in data warehouse in the same sentence is you've committed a heinous religious war sin of the Kinman Inman, uh, Kimball Inman thing from years ago. But that said, yes, and uh, Kelly, that was the example you expressed, right? Exactly, that was, yes, that's exactly. right. Exactly, yeah, exactly. There's people doing that now. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, the next one was um, a comment uh, that, that, that I, I already addressed uh, earlier. Um, let's see here. Uh, can Hadoop be used in a data warehouse effectively? Well, okay, that's a semantics thing. If you're going to call data warehouse something with structure um, and uh, to maintain the time variance and, and all of that kind of stuff, Probably not. It's it probably not. Now here and here's why. Here's something for and this is to those of us listening. We've got about 400 people still on this thing listening right now. The old question of how do you know your data warehouse is built right? I can ask the same question today, ask the exact same query 10 years from now, and I get the exact same answer because we've managed the time variance way. Hadoop is not set up very well to do that. Okay, so I would say we're probably leaning away from that. Can the ODS be a data lake? Well, um, operational data store, the keyword there is operational. If your latencies are incredibly low and you're streaming in a lot of stuff, Hadoop's a little sluggish for real-time update. Um, you can keep adding stuff to it, but if something changes, you're really in um, 
uh, a bit of a, a pickle there. This is where the engineering comes in. So if I have a transaction that has changed a value um, and I want to update that transaction in place for an operational use, that's going to be really tough in Hadoop. But if I want to just add something to the end of, of a columnar thing, maybe I can get away with it. Again, this is where the engineering comes in. There's not a, there's not a pat answer uh, 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 to that. Um, let's see here. Uh, if the data assets in the data lurk are stored in a near exact or even exact format as a sort, wouldn't that make retrieval from the lake be challenging? Yes. Kelly, that's why we have really smart people plowing through that stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's why that's the data. I mean, uh, we have been in the room and watched these people working and we work with them all the time now. And, and, um, and yes, it is this, it is that challenge that spurred the evolution of warehouses and marts and that's again that is speaking the, these questions are speaking to our point which is not one size is not going to fit all at all um sorry to be redundant but i did that for emphasis um uh here um it can be really hard to get something out of the data lake unless you've done some some uh understanding of when you loaded it in as to where things are and put some type of uh, uh there's a new product out uh atlas is one um, some vendors out there, and we're not naming vendors on, on on this thing, but there are vendors now that help you manage your data lake and actually put a layer of metadata on top, so you can actually do a relational navigation of that stuff. But if, in its raw form, it's very hard to, to navigate. Um, uh, let's see. Do you recommend the data lake as a play area? Possible. Uh, then the data warehouse figure out the need. Absolutely. How do you govern a data lake so it doesn't become swamp? Um, that's the governance requirement. Um, if you don't keep that lake pristine um, with a lot of rules, a lot of governance, a clarity of what you're putting in there, it will become the that junk drawer. Right, Kelly? That's the metaphor we've heard more than, than swamp. It's a junk drawer. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that the, um, uh, the go there's governance around the lake. There's general governance around the data to start with, right? So uh, if you have a good understanding of the data from a source perspective, then it's very easy to extend that understanding as that data gets loaded into the lake and that sort of thing. Um, the tools are becoming much more sophisticated to be able to uh, share that data understanding, the concept of metadata around a data lake, you know, now that uh, Atlas is becoming more mature. Uh, is coming to fruition, and so the tools are going to continue to mature and give us that that mm -hmm. um, yeah. visibility, and of course the security and the privacy is also continuing to mature, and uh, there's third parties that tools that you would also use to manage uh, the security and privacy, and of course considering things like how you can obfuscate the data and things like that. So. Um, but again, it's not just governance around the data lake, um, it's governance around the data and ensuring that that same governance extends to uh, the data lake is, I think, the important way to consider it. Um, so um, uh, next question then, how much data governance, you segue to the next question just beautifully, um, how much data governance is needed in the lake? If data governance is applied, does it make data injection slower? Data governance isn't necessarily an automated thing you apply. It's some rules of engagement with the data. Um, which, and, and by the way, this question, and, and not reflecting on who asked it, but we also hear similar questions from, from data scientists who absolutely have no idea what data governance is. They just have, understand the algorithmic part of their work and have no idea that there is actually some, some uh, process out there to to prevent things from happening. This is more applying the rules of regulations before the data even gets there. So there is no automated thing that would slow you down. If you just kind of get things positioned the right way before they're even loaded, you, that's not going to slow you down at all. Um, the next one, a really nice comment, which is really important for everybody listening here. Starting out to build a hive environment, we are seeing limitations. For example, we can add an append, which I talked about, but are recommended to not update. Absolutely. That's like changing the tire on an Airbus while it's rolling down the runway. It's really hard to do. We are also seeing very slow query response times, especially compared to data warehouse solutions. Absolutely. Because this, these are columnar type structures. They are designed for sequential 
read, not for direct reading, not for selects, not for for uh, joins. Um, you know, we get really wonky when we have a four-way outer join in a data warehouse. A two-way simple join in a massive uh, Hadoop type structure could be a real killer for uh, response time. They can be that. You know that type of thing and translating that type of what we would call a two-way join into a into a, a search through um, HDFS could be could can be a nightmare uh, performance-wise. Then again, this is where the engineering comes in. If you need to do something uh, low latency and near time or real time reporting or BI or 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 uh, uh, operational type things, um, you're probably not going to get a lot of help from a Hadoop type structure. Um, uh, let's see here. We're, we're at the top of our time. We're going to, we have a lot of questions here. Here's what we're going to do. Um, these are going to be sent to Kelly and I after the talk. And because this is a rich set of stuff, we're going to answer these tonight uh, and get those back out to everybody as quick as Sharon, Shannon can get those out at this point because we are out of time. And thank you so much, everybody, for uh, a tremendous amount of interest here today. Um, you can just see how what a cool, hot topic this is and how dynamic our industry is. It's a wonderful thing. Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you for, um, for a wrap-up here. John and Kelly, thank you for another fabulous webinar. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. As John says, I just love all the questions coming in um, regarding as, uh, this topic. Um, and as John mentioned, I will get a follow-up email to all of the registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording on the session, and some additional answers for you for the additional questions that we've got outstanding. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great day. Again, thank you for participating. We hope to see you next month. And um, John and Kelly, thank you again, as always. Yes, many thank you. Yes, so thank all so you listeners. We'll see you next month. It'll be even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day.